rise with your leave to wind up the debate of the bill shortly entitled Appropriation Bill 2023-2022, Madam Speaker. I think that all would have been said and all would have been given ample opportunity to make their presentation on this most important bill. Let me start out by saying how proud I am of the team on the government side for really in a short period of time having the opportunity to put a comprehensive budget together. This side has demonstrated that it is indeed very well prepared. And even though the time might have been curtailed because we only take office, or we only took office on the 6th of August, 2022, when most of the year would have gone. It shows that when we spoke about what we intend to do, once the people would have invested their trust in us, that we weren't merely speaking words, but we were actually serious. And so when we spoke about developing what we now call the sustainable small island state, in fact, we were very, very much serious when it came to, to that. And so, as you can see from the budget, which speaks to our progress as a sustainable small island state, you would recognize that in that budget, a great deal of discussions would have taken place. We would have acted quite prudently. And we would not have acted callously, but prudently, understanding where we are economically as a region and where the world is. And if you were to look at this document, which has my address, you would recognize that it says medium term economic management strategy on page 33, and it says there medium term fiscal and debt outlook and growth targets. That was taken into consideration, looking at where we are now and where we are expected to be in the medium term. Of course, having done the research and the consultation to really help to frame the budget which would, of course, respond to our sustainable island state overarching goal. And so, if anyone were to give the impression that we were callous, or that we had not thought of this, or that we had not done the necessary research and study and consultation, I think that that person is woefully misguided. And I would also like to add that we would have consulted with multiple stakeholders, notwithstanding the time. And as we said, we are a transparent and open government, and we will continue the consultation. Because this, of course, is something that has to roll out. And we expect to engage the people every step of the way. And so when we speak about our capital projects, we expect to engage the people. When we speak about our transformations, we expect to engage the people. When we speak about transparency and the good governance agenda, we expect to consult the people. And so the process of consultation is not just over a mere few days, but the process of consultation should be constantly ongoing because as we have said, we are people-focused, a people-centered administration. That is what this Labour government is all about. And so I want people to look and see where our strategy came from 
where we look at our medium-term economic management strategy, and that, of course, would have informed our budget, and that, of course, would help us to accomplish our goals and what we would have promised the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Madam Speaker, I, of course, would have heard a number of critical things. But what I must say here is that what we are trying to achieve at this point in time is that we have to respond to a popular term, a term called the urgency of now, which means we have to survive as a people. We must survive as a people. We are facing an existential threat, an existential threat because of climate change. And we are expecting the temperature to reach and possibly surpass the increase in which would be 1.5 degrees Celsius. And with that, we expect significant changes in the climate, including stronger hurricanes, which we are prone to. And that we expect can cause significant damage, and therefore we have to prepare ourselves for the changes that are to come. And so we have prepared a budget in response to all of that. Madam Speaker, I do recognize that in this government, one person cannot do it alone. And that is the hallmark of this government, in that we have persons on this side who are experts in the various fields, experts. We have persons who are experts in what we call the sustainable development field, when we talk about geography and so forth, in the person of our member, our senator, sorry, the Honorable Dr. Joya Clark. We have professional farmers who have demonstrated and have won awards in the person of the Honorable Samuel Duggins. We have experts in the field of education in the person of the Honorable Prime, Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Jeffrey Henley. We have legal luminaries who have demonstrated themselves significantly, and we have that in our member from number two. And in our number three, we know that our representative there is a trained engineer and is well versed in engineering and also ICT and so he's taking on that. If you go to constituency number six, we have a former prime minister for over 20 years with tremendous experience. And so when you look at even our junior senator who has advanced studies in gender issues, who is the junior minister, minister for that particular ministry. So as I go from one to two to three to four to five to six, as, I mean to six, and even to eight, myself and our two senators, you quickly recognize that on this side, that we have people who are youthful, yes, but who have demonstrated competence in the various field, and that is why in such short time, we were able to put such a budget together. A transformative budget, a budget that will change St. Kitts and Nevis, because when this team was put together, and when we sat and we discussed, we said that if we cannot transform St. Kitts and Nevis to make it the best that it can be once again in the OECS and the Caribbean, then all of this really makes no sense at all. But we have been able to do that, Madam Speaker, and that is why I always speak of the team, because it is important. When you juxtapose this team to the past team, you recognize quickly how we differ in our goals, yes, but in also of the substance and the quality of the team. We would have said to the people that in choosing the then team unity, that the leader of that team unity, his main interest was not St. Kitts and Nevis. We said that. We said that and it has been demonstrated clearly by what has happened over the last seven years. If a government falls in just, our administration falls in just seven years. We had charges of corruption, charges of distrust, charges of incompetence, charges which would have leveled within that team. It shows, therefore, that the leader of that team definitely is a failed leader. And that is why even though sometimes 
We might speak to the team in general, and we should on certain issues, of course, but we do recognize that certain actions were taken by members of that team to really change the course in which St. Kitts and Nevis was going. So in one breath, while you have to hit them for what took place, you also have to reflect on the fact that at least at some point they decided that that was the wrong team for St. Kitts and Nevis. And I must recognize that. Madam Speaker, so today we are here with the St. Kitts Nevis led administration and this administration will get things right for our people. So a number of things were recorded and I would rebut a number of things, especially when it came from the member for number five. And I recognize that he's not here to hear the rebuttal. But I decided that I wanted to hear almost every speaker in this debate because I think it was important since I was presenting this budget and they would respond to the budget, of course. And I want to say that he spoke about innovation and that he had not seen innovation in the budget. I think that he has to change his glasses. I think that he may not have read the budget. I think that he may not have listened to the presentation of the speakers on this side. And therefore, if that is the case, then maybe I might absolve him from his responsibility. But in this sense, Madam Speaker, I want to point out a number of innovative, transform transformative things that will come from this budget. Let's look at transformation to a sustainable island state. That in itself tells you that we are moving our nation in a particular direction where it can sustain itself, Madam Speaker. That is a lofty goal. That speaks, of course, that we are serious about making and think it's making think it's a nevis viable, resilient, resilient not only in terms of its economy, but resilient physically and structurally to deal with the changes of climate. We would have spoken about, of course, in achieving this, we have to look at our water situation. For seven years, no real investments were made in water on St. Kitts, Madam Speaker. As a matter of fact, we had a company called Bead that they had chosen to really slow down or stop their work and in the last minute try to re-engage them again. So seven years, nothing done for the development in that sector. No water. The people in Kayon crying for seven years under an administration that had a representative from Kayon. And he's from the party from whence come the member from number five. He's actually the leader of that party. And with the cries of the people of Kayon who had voted for them significantly, no response. And so the people of Kayon continue to hurt. Madam Speaker, you heard the minister responsible for water, spoke about the water board and the innovations of having diesel plant driven by solar energy, the accommodation that we will make with the Marriott so that it can give a break to our aquifer and give it a chance to recharge. That is innovation. Looking at more investments, Madam Speaker, in the diesel, um, looking at the diesel technology. Innovation, because what we don't realize is that if we cannot supply enough water, we cannot talk about transformation even of the, of the economy. Because I can recall that I was speaking to a particular investor and the first thing he asked for, how much water do you have? How much energy do you have? And I could not say to him that I even had enough water at that particular point. And therefore, Madam Speaker, for us to become resilient and to deal with the economic changes that are coming, 
If we don't have something as basic as water, how can we even start to respond? And so we are taking these innovative steps when it comes to dealing with our water shortages here on St. Kitts, because I think on Nevis, it is a bit different. Madam Speaker, energy. The same member from number five was the minister responsible for Skelec. Not one innovative idea or plan was brought forward in terms of transforming that energy sector. When we got there, generators breaking down because they were old. New generators needed to be brought in. But that was never done, Madam Speaker. No real look into how they can make sure that that would have taken place. When we got there, we recognized quickly how high the fuel cost was and that we had to subsidize it. And part of our promise in our manifesto, we said that we'll give every person a rebate. But we have recognized that that rebate comes because we are paying that fuel cost that does not go towards the consumer. We're protecting the consumer by paying, I think, around nine million dollars per month, upwards of that sometime. Madam Speaker, we are looking for innovative ways in which we can bring down our energy costs because if we bring down the, the cost of our energy, that will save a tremendous amount of money to be used in other sectors or just have it as a savings, Madam Speaker. Nine times 12 gives you a great idea of how many millions of dollars we invest to protect the people of St. Kitts and people of St. Kitts from having such a high cost of energy. And so when we speak about renewable energy, investing in geothermal, I know that I had signed off and I know that the minister responsible for sustainable development had collaborated with Nevis and the premier of Nevis and I would have spoken. I did not even recognize that it had already been approved. That for real, we can have geothermal energy here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. A goal that we have been, spoken, been speaking about for a very long time, that we can achieve in a few short years and become one of the countries in the Caribbean using geothermal energy. Madam Speaker, when you look at solar energy, that is innovation. When you look at solar energy, we are now gone beyond lithium battery, and we are thinking about capacitors that can replace them and ensure that we can create a modular system in developing solar energy. We're going to be speaking about that much more in about a month, because there will be in St. Kitts, possibly the only place in the Caribbean where we'll have that technology providing about three to five megawatts of power. When I received the picture of the modular being built about a week ago, I felt pleased. That is innovation. Because we are serious that we can convert this federation into the first sustainable island state of the Caribbean. It is very, very possible and very, very possible in this term of our administration, Madam Speaker. And so we are looking at solar energy, where we can encourage persons to buy their own solar panels and install them. But what we'll make sure is that Skelet can approve them so that you can have feed into our network. So let's say you have a solar system and you take in this amount of energy, how many kilowatts? and you use just a portion of it, and you have some stored in battery, you can send some back to Skelec and work out a payment. We can achieve that here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Because while we do not have fossil fuel, we have solar, we have wind, we have geothermal, and we also have waves. Waves, Madam Speaker. I would like to say that we have to look at this as a real possibility. Because if you go to the Middle East, or even Guyana, Venezuela at this point in time, they have a lot of fossil fuel. They're drilling for it. But the fossil fuel comes out of the earth or comes from under the sea, does not just go into a car and the car is driven. That has to be processed to some extent and be in a form 
that can be used to drive cars, drive generators. And in the same way, if we have the sun, the geothermal, waves, and wind, and we can convert that into an energy form that would allow us to export it and use it in different ways, then I think we are blessed in a different way. We just have to be able now to be able to implement that in a technology that can be used. Madam Speaker, that is innovation, and that is in this budget as we speak. Innovation, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, innovation again is where we are speaking about the construction of homes. But these are not just homes, these are smart homes that would provide jobs and put our people back to work here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Our construction workers, our plumbers, our electricians, our joiners, our heavy equipment operators, as they build these smart homes, homes that can withstand high winds and the effects of climate change that will be have with them solar panels and can have, of course, some water storage associated with them. That is innovation, Madam Speaker, and that is in this budget. Madam Speaker, we also spoke about the ICT and how important ICT is, not only for the transformation of our day, everyday operations, but a modern economy would need to have as its foundation a strong ICT sector and a strong ICT build out. One of the things people ask when they come, oh, how much bandwidth do you have? How fast is your internet? They want to know these things to determine whether they can invest in your country or not. And so you can't even talk about transformation of your economy or a resilient economy if you can't even provide basic things like this. And that is why we are determined to become the, to become the first country in the Caribbean to have an e-government. Actually, as I speak, we are already talking to people about it. In this budget, we have the money allotted to it to make sure that we can build it out. And we'll have further investments, as a matter of fact. And I will say right now, we are running fiber optic cables within the health sector because I intend to, develop, to deliver ICT in health by the mid of this year coming up. That is innovation. What would that do? Increase efficiency. Cut cost, Madam Speaker. Cost savings will be, of course, very important. Allow us to build properly. Sometimes we get people from outside and because we don't have a good billing system, we can't charge properly. When we have a system like that, savings and the potential to bring in more revenue, that is how we create a resilient economy. So you're not just creating, using ICT just because you're using ICT, but because it can have a positive impact on the delivery of health, and apart from that, it can actually help savings and increase revenues, Madam Speaker. That is what you call innovation that we'll bring here for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Madam Speaker, we talk about the digital ID. We are a modern country. That again would help us to save savings because we become more efficient and as a result more effective. Cut down on the use of paper, transaction being faster, time is money. That in itself will help you to create a stronger economy. Madam Speaker, these are innovations right in this budget. But when you don't come to Parliament to listen and you don't read the budget properly, you will come to the Parliament and say things like, there's no innovation in the budget. Read the budget, read the budget listen to the debate, and then you can comment intelligently on it, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we talk about greenhouse villages when it comes to food security. We talk about hydroponics. We talk about having a center for the development of different breeds of farm animals so that we don't have the constant inbreeding that is affecting the quality of our meat and milk production and so forth, Madam Speaker. Right there in my constituency in Bearfords, and I've spoken to Mr. Bell, who is a graduate of Cuba as well, and I'm going to visit Bearfords. And today that was mentioned by our member from number Nevis 11. And we have expanding on that, Madam Speaker, so that we can become more food secure.
by making sure that we are breeding the type of animals that we need here in St. Kitts and Nevis. That is innovation, Madam Speaker. Right in this budget, money is allotted to that. But they never read the budget, never listened to debate, and come in here to talk about they don't see any innovation. How are you going to see if you ain't read and look? Madam Speaker, the innovation ain't stop there because this is an innovative administration. Let's look at greenhouses and greenhouse villages. I know when the government changed in 2015, there was a robust greenhouse plan across the country. Greenhouses and shade houses were being built across the country and it stopped for a good while, a long time. And that, a lot of greenhouses ran down. For example, the one in Connery, that I had helped to secure for the young farmers over there. After the government changed the greenhouse, ran down to the dirt, their investments were lost. But we know that shade houses and greenhouses, as was mentioned even by the member from Nevis 11, that we are going to build villages of greenhouses and shade houses because we believe in using the technology in agriculture so that we can use less land to produce more and produce better quality products. That is innovation, Madam Speaker, and that is in this budget. Madam Speaker, as I go through here, I can also spe speak about what we will be doing with respect to fish production and our blue economy. Our blue economy must be developed, Madam Speaker, because as I've said before, that we have more resources in the sea than we have on land. And we are attracting modern investments to develop that, and of course we will be looking at techniques, new techniques, including labs that has to do with this type of thing. We're looking at how we can get to the deeper waters, Madam Speaker, how we can process and package Again, did not listen to the debate to its entirety, did not read the estimates, otherwise he would recognize that even during the presentation of the Minister of Agriculture, the member from number four, he would have spoken about this. Madam Speaker, this is to ensure that we can strengthen our food security platform. This will bring monies to our fishers pocket money into the economy, strengthening the economy, helping us to diversify, while at the same time using new techniques and being innovative. That is why I say people come and sometimes they talk and they have not looked into the estimates, have not listened to the debate, and yet want to come tell us that there is no innovation. Madam Speaker, I can go on and look at even on the Key aside, with other, our elderly care strategy, we have developed a whole ministry called Aging with Dignity. And in this elderly care, Aging with Dignity, we are going to make sure that we are going to embark on a number of critical things to protect our elderly population. So they're not abused. One of the things we start doing is to create daycares for our elderly folk, Madam Speaker. Nothing like that at this point in time. You know, people who have the elderly parents, how hard it is for them. I met a lady, for example, in Old Road, and she said I had to stay home and look after my elderly parent. She said, this lady raised me, and I wanted to see her have a good end of life. She said she had to cut her second job, which means less money, and then secondly, she had to invest, so she was losing money on both fronts, which caused tremendous economic pain. But had she had the services of her elderly care, she can continue to work, to be productive, and to be able to contribute more to her home, her family, in terms of resources. This would help to strengthen homes, and strengthen families, and strengthen communities, and by extension, strengthen our country. So Madam Speaker, when they say no innovation, tell them this thing is filled with innovation. Because the last seven years here in St. Kitts, hardly any new thing was done. You can't point to anything, Madam Speaker. Nothing at all you can point to. And when people here, the me uh, people would have heard the no member from number five speaking, they would have thought that the member from number five is totally new to the process. 
He was there for seven years. And up to May, when he got fired this year, he was there. And so I thought he should have taken the approach from the other members and say, you came in after it would have passed six months, so you need, we need more time to fully see your budget. But instead, he came in and grandstand and looked for one word in the budget and, and went in the whole thing, say that he's studying it at this moment. Sometimes when you study one thing, you think that's it. You know, when I was in medical school, you study blood pressure, you think you got blood pressure. You study pneumonia, you think you got pneumonia. So he read one thing about innovation, and he knows everything about innovation all of a sudden because he's studying for some exam. Madam Speaker, that is not the way that we should continue to have these budget debates, but they should be based of course and substance. Madam Speaker, there's so much innovation in this. Let me go on to the smart hospital. The smart hospital, I want to say that I was told that we already found 15 acres of virgin land as an option to build our smart hospital. The smart hospital is a climate smart hospital. And I like what was said. This hospital will be for people of St. Kitts and people of Nevis. All of our people would have access to this hospital. And we would like to collaborate even more with the people from Nevis when it comes to health, because I think if we share our resources, we can have more for all of our people. For example, the city scan, brand new city scan over in Nevis, and we're going to have a brand new MRI over here. Nothing wrong with going over Nevis and getting a city scan done, or the Nevisians coming over and doing an MRI. We have to share our resources. If we are to be sustainable and to do it in a smart way, there must be more collaboration, Madam Speaker. This hospital, I intend it to be a smart hospital. It will be a smart hospital. It will be able, of course, to manage all of the cases that we'll have here in St. Kitts and Nevis. It will be able to withstand strong hurricanes and the insidious changes of climate change. We will also make sure that our hospital is up to date with ICT, but we're not going to wait until this hospital is done to include the digital transformation within the health sector. We have already started some of that already. This smart hospital will provide jobs, lots of jobs for our people in many different areas, as this will be a major, major capital project. And so that will provide jobs for our people in this year coming up along with all the houses that we are going to build, along with all of the major other capital projects that we are going to have, and the continuation of some of those uh, projects that would have already been started. So Madam Speaker, I can stay here, and I can speak to innovation after innovation after innovation which is in this budget. Madam Speaker, I want to touch even on the medicinal or the cannabis industry. And to say to our people out there that when the AG spoke, the AG spoke to the present law, that law we met there. The AG, of course, is a lawman and believes in the rule of law as I do. And based on the present law, it stipulates certain things that must be respected. However, we are a progressive administration. And we do recognize that there must be certain changes within the law to accommodate the new cannabis um, sector. One of the things that was spoken of, can you look at some place like the Eco um, Park and create a section there where people come from outside, or even our own people can have a section where they can enjoy that industry? Do we need to change the laws to make sure that we are progressive? And I want to say to those who, are, who enjoy the herb, I want to say to them, that we recognize that there needs to be changes. <laughs> I've read a lot about it. <laughs> we recognize that there must be changes as the world is now changing, but we'll do that in a responsible way. And in doing such, we want to make sure that we protect those who must be protected, but we also want to give opportunity to, for those who are a part of that. And so we will find the balance, and that is what the AG was alluding to. But the present law, as we met it, speaks to that. The AG has been progressive. He has said, based on the law, you just can't walk in somebody's yard and pull up their ganja plant. That can't be done. And so he said to them, to the police, this is the law. You just can't walk into somebody's yard and pull their plant up. At the same time, he's saying the law is saying, well, you just can't smoke any way you want. 
And even if the law becomes more progressive, I would still like to admonish people to you know, respect that everybody is not in it. You know, you could drink it everywhere, uh, anywhere, but you can't smoke it anywhere. God, not everybody wants to inhale the smoke, and that should be respected. So you can enjoy what you want to enjoy, but at the same time, respect others as others might have a different preference. But we'll deal with expansion of records, and he's going to expand that. Because I have held on the campaign trail that many of our young people have criminal records because of the possession of marijuana. And we need to expunge them. Why? How can you have an 18, 19 year old who might have been caught with marijuana 2021 and you condemn them for life? They can't get a visa. They can't go to university. They can't get a proper job. How can you condemn them for life for some herb? And the reason why I am so adamant against it is because in the United States of America, when young people are caught with cocaine, they treat it as a medical issue. Send them to for rehabilitation and clean their records. Even a president of the United States would have said he would have used cocaine in his younger years. And so why are we condemning our young people? Because they would have been involved in that. I'm not telling them that they should get involved. But I'm saying that we have to be more open-minded, progressive, and to, of course, give our young people the opportunity so that they can flourish as adults. And so we can't condemn our young people so early in life. And that is why we want to expunge those records and give them an opportunity to go to university, get a visa if they have to travel, get a job, and that too will be an innovative type of approach. So Madam Speaker, so when I hear people saying that there is no innovation in the budget, I get really, really nervous. He also spoke to the fact that there might be a recession. And as I told you, we were prudent in looking at how we would frame our budget, not being pulled out of the sky, but through consultation. And thus far, the models are showing even though there is a threat, we, we, we are most likely not to have a recession. Or we can expect some growth, actually. That is what it is showing at this point in time. And so based on what we have now, that is what we are building out on. You cannot come and present a budget of gloom and doom when actually you have the opportunities to transform your economy and be resilient. That is why we said we have to build towards a sustainable small island state that is going to be a resilient small island state. That is the innovation we need because once we were to solve our energy problem, we'll have a lot of savings and that would give us the opportunity then to make sure that we can transform our economy as well. And so I want the people out there to know that this has been innovative and this has been well thought out. And even though we had a shortened period of time, we have delivered for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Madam Speaker, in coming to office, what did we find in the government? What have we found in doing our deep dive. There are some things I cannot speak to even though people are asking me to speak to certain things because things are being looked at by the relevant professionals and information is being gathered. And that will be presented to the people when that process would have gone through. We are not in the process of a witch hunt, but we are in a process of finding out what really took place. Madam Speaker, what I can say clearly is that the past administration, led by the member from number seven, led a corrupt government. And I hold no water in my mouth and that is why I say sometimes that even though those who were with him, you have to really hold them accountable. But at the same time, they might have recognized what I'm speaking about and decided the best for the nation was to take a different course. Madam Speaker, it is as if the whole government was predicated 
and corruption. Everywhere you look is an instance of corruption. People involved in corruption and don't know that they're involved in corruption. For example, you ask them about the procurement act. Well, how you could give a contract for $500,000 and there's no bidding? Well, I was instructed. You were instructed, you signed. But the man who instructed you did not sign. Not a, not a paper. You can be held responsible. While he who told you to sign is absolved. Madam Speaker, when you look at the procurement issues, shutting out of people and selecting people, And when you look at how the process was gone about, even the persons who signed don't even know that they are responsible for paying the people. So when people come into the government asking for the rest of their pay, and you pull the document and you recognize all the laws were violated, and you tell them, go to paper to get your money, they think you are joking. But the truth is, they may not have even known that they were in such violations. And so here they have signed a paper, but the person who instructed them has not signed anything. And leave you totally exposed to the law. That is what took place with respect to that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when you go through um, the systems again, and you look and you see how monies were spent, and you ask people, how did this happen? I was instructed. I mean, I spoke about the Bastia High School. They're still calling for money, not even recognizing that they have broke, been part of breaking the law. Because they're saying, well, the minister said, you can't say that. You are breaking the law, and we saw millions of dollars being lost as a result. $14 million spent on the Bastia High School and nothing to show. What do you mean, dirt deal? Right? Well, dirt deal. Dirt deal. Dirt deal. $14 million. Madam Speaker, I, yes, I, yes, I found in my own ministry a ring, a ring of illegal marriages. Madam Speaker, is this like, let me tell you how this ring works. I have it written down here. There's somebody in Santo Domingo who charging a lot of money for a visa. You pay them for a lot of, you pay them for a visa there. They have a connection here. So you buy your plane ticket and you come in with your very expensive visa of which this government only making 10%. When they come in, Madam Speaker, a husband or wife is waiting for them. So they're gone. Marry more money again, Madam Speaker. For, for me time they get married, Madam Speaker, same day, sometimes in the wedding garments, they're gone for the certificate of marriage. After they get the certificate of marriage, in the electoral office for ID, citizenship. citizenship, yeah, certificate of citizenship, and then they're gone for their ID. Once they go for their ID, <coughs> Madam Speaker, they are paid a certain sum of money, and their name is included on an electoral list to vote. Who is the Minister of National Security? He needs to answer. He's absent, not even to respond to the budget. Coward! He needs to accept these responsibilities and respond. Madam Speaker, this thing hurts badly, you know. I went to a meeting with the community, and they have legitimate concerns which we have to address. 
Because as was said, we cannot treat people less than human. But at the same time, every country must have rules, laws, and regulations, as I said to them. That not even in their own country can it be done like that. You're asking a married person, so my husband's name? They don't know. Well, I think the first name might be, well, I can't remember the first name. And you're married? I call him babe. Babes. <laughs> Saying to the AG, I saying to the officials that, well, I don't know his name. I call him Babes. Me <laughs> amor? Babes. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is serious business. Madam Speaker, I am speaking the truth when I saw that. And I have a box. Of a few hundreds, Madam Speaker. I don't even know where to start because among them might be real marriages, but because there are so much fake mar marriages among them, you don't even know where to start, Madam Speaker. Thousands upon thousands of dollars. And this is how it works you come, you're married, you divorce, you marry again. And then you pass, it, you pass on the citizenship here, there, and everywhere. That is how it works, Madam Speaker. And then the, those persons who are involved in it, they say, well, you know, $3,000. Then they get divorced and they're looking for a next marriage because that's another quick $3,000. Madam Speaker. Citizenship. And then, then you get an ID card. And I spoke to them directly. I had a meeting with the community because, as I said, we're going to treat people humanely. But I told them this is what we uncovered and discovered. And therefore, we cannot continue that path. It's a whole ring where we were even being questioned to be part of human trafficking. Registered in one, two, and something three. Madam Speaker, people have to be responsible for these things. Our country was going down the drain. Going down the drain, Madam Speaker. And so we uncovered that. We uncovered the fake marriages. And also, they had a visa ring that was running. And all the time, they're collecting information. And people think, well, I don't talk a lot outside of when I have to talk. So people may not know that I observe more than I talk. And I collect more than I talk. And you see all the, the, the visa ring. Hush, puppy. Madam Speaker, I don't think the age you touch on hush, puppy. Walk it up, they walk it up to the, the Prime Minister's office the same day they get it. As soon as I get it, they walk it to the Prime Minister's office, fast track it. Expedite it. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I, I would say that the Minister of Foreign Affairs then he's not shown to be anywhere in the in, in it. Say it again. <laughs> 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 we have looked. <laughs> but the hush puppy scenario. There were people involved in it not knowing that they were involved in an illegal, underhanded act, Madam Speaker. They just did not know. <coughs> because it is disguised. They're just given orders. Make sure that reach up to the office quickly. And you're a, sir, you're a civil servant. And you make sure it reach up quickly. And then you hear sometime after, oh, well, maybe that's why I was asked to rush it up quickly. But you were just carrying out an order. Madam Speaker, that, again, is a wanton type of corruption. Madam Speaker, if I go over in the development bank. Oh, my. Oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. That's another three hours and 21. Madam Speaker, if I go over in the development bank. Time, 
<laughs> let me say, <laughs> let me say, Madam Speaker, that I want to start by saying that we have been able to put a competent board together. We have an acting manager, and we have been able to stabilize the situation there. So whatever I say after, I want them to know that it, that was before, but we have done what we have to do to stabilize the bank, and the bank now is stable. And so persons can continue to do business with the bank. But before that, Madam Speaker, the bank was in bad state of affairs. They had no audit of the bank since for about two to three years. And when you ask, why is the bank not audited, they said, well, COVID. All the other banks are audited in St. Kitts, except one bank. So COVID was only over the development bank. Yes. No other bank had COVID. <laughs> no other bank had COVID, Madam Speaker, except the development bank. <laughs> COVID, so you can't audit the bank. Madam Speaker, you're gone in the bank. There is no money in the bank, Madam Speaker. No money in the bank. Where is the money? Madam Speaker, you go in there and you see Documents missing. All kind of loans that nobody else know about. Madam Speaker. People in there carrying out transactions and they don't know what type of transactions they are carrying out except sometimes they are just being told to do a particular thing. Madam Speaker, I can't speak too much to the bank because we are looking deep into the bank. That is, not, that is not fair, Madam Speaker. That is not fair. Let me tell you something that happened in the bank, Madam Speaker. The past CEO of the bank had a document signed that said he will be paid out his contract up to 2025 in the amount of almost a million dollars. Few days before the elections, Madam Speaker. And guess what? And that he would have started a new contract on the 1st of January, 2023. So he would have been paid twice, Madam Speaker, had this government not changed a million dollars almost gone from the development bank in the pocket of the CEO. I have the minutes. These things are vexing things. Huh? Almost a million dollars, Madam Speaker. Paid out up to 2025 and he ain't work yet. Oh, you could pay out a man up to 2025 and still hire him during this, the same period and increase his pay. So it's twice plus because he would have been paid more than he would have paid, been paid before. Are you getting a job? <laughs> Madam Speaker, almost a million dollars gone. Just like that. Whoosh. Whoosh. Poof. You remember the poof? Poof. Gone <laughs> <laughs> just like that poof. And it's gone. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in my own ministry, Ministry of Health, one security company. How many millions, AG? 10.7, I think. 10.7 million dollars. Up the hospital, sometimes the nurses say, you got more guards and shift than nurses. <laughs> Nobody else had the opportunity.
to win a bid. Millions of dollars, Madam Speaker, in my own ministry. Sorry, 10.9. 10.9 million dollars. For the security company. Madam Speaker, I am still discovering all kind of rental of vehicles, you know. There's a vehicle that is being rented that if you just get a few months, you could buy a new one. In the Ministry of Health, and I think I don't know. I don't know how they think I don't know these things. If I was in opposition, I don't know how I'm in government and I ain't gonna know. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, money just going down. Then again, I just discovered the IT company in all kind of ways in my ministries. Money going here, money going there, money going all over the place. You know Madam Speaker, we know about the 11 million. 11 point how much? But I'm sure we're going to uncover more because I just discovered a source. I have to ask the age if he knows about that source. Uh, digital government. Yes. 11 point seven. 11 Jesus. And not transformation. Somewhere Nobody somewhere. else in this country had the opportunity to earn a dollar. And you want to come in here, come talk about innovation and prudent and all sorts of things. That's why I think the member from number five should have taken the other road and say, look, I was there up to eight months, so let me see where you're going to come with next year. But you can't come here and come talk about, yes, you know, innovation, you ain't listen nothing, you ain't read nothing, and you're talking because you read a passage from a book for exam. Can't work like that, Madam Speaker. So that, again, is money. I had decided, some people might say you're holding back some. One, we have to make sure that the correct information come forward. But if you cast a broad net, Madam Speaker, You'll be surprised to get caught up in the net and some of the people will tell you I did not even know that I was involved and some of them are being honest because they just didn't know. So that is why I said this whole government was predicated on corruption. And that is why I'm saying to the AG, you have to bring the anti-corruption bill. You have to bring the integrity in public life. Amendment. The amendment. So when I'm gone, and somebody else comes, that the system is protected from that person. It's robust. It's robust. And sometimes human beings have to put things in place to protect the system from even themselves. Absolutely. Because we are human beings, we are flawed sure. by our very nature, correct? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Remember from number one? That's by our word. very nature. That's yep. the word. Okay, and that is why the age spoke about the rule of law and not the rule of man. So that we can have some barriers that would limit us. So that this never ever happens again in St. Kitts and Nevis. Madam Speaker, we used to talk about the nepotism. I said on the campaign trail that he did not need any of them over there. And they found out he didn't need any of them. Because the kitchen table was the cabinet of St. Kitts and Nevis. Harry's kitchen table was the cabinet of St. Kitts and Nevis. They controlled the bank, Madam Speaker. They controlled the court. They even reached up in the CIU, mm -hmm. Madam Speaker. They controlled prison. the prison. Send home James for eight months so that a particular person can control the prison, Madam Speaker. So when you control all the levels of power of a country, well, you ain't need nobody else. No wonder the man went as far as calling the member from number five, Mumu. Even though the member from number five and I are different politically, I will never say that about him. The man just do a certification, he told us. The least he is, is that. But yet the member from number seven, who benefited from his loyalty, instead of being grateful, called him Mumu. I mean, how these things happen? 
How all of this happened here in St. Kitts and Nevis? And so they control the bank, Ministry of Finance, the CIU, the courts. What else are control? Those are them? The payroll office. The payroll office. The peace program, the step program. The PAP. This is one family I'm talking about here. One family. The lands. And look at what's happening to the lands. There's a gentleman from my constituency who tried to buy a estate. Already paid his money for the estate. They took the estate from the man and sell it to a family member. Only they want his own estate. The man is from St. Kitts, has his legitimate money, pay for the estate, but the estate he should not own, taken away from him, illegally so. And that is why I've said the man deserves to get back his land and then sell it to a family member. This was a takeover of a state by a family and in corrupt ways. Everybody else was a pawn. You are a pawn at some time. Sometimes you think you're a big fish, but you ain't no big fish. Ask Sam Condo. Ask Dwyer Astafan. Ask them. Ask the members on the other side. They think they're big fish, but they're small fish. They were just being used for a period of time. To get where he wanted. To, to get where he wanted. And once he would have used you, then he discarded you. But I think the worst case of use, abuse, and discard is what he did to the member from number five. That is what took place, Madam Speaker, in the last government. And that is why hardly anything was achieved. Because maybe you have a sincere member over there who said, man, yes, let's get the government, man. Let's, you know, maybe member from number 11 must say, boy, let's improve, increase food production and get this and get that. But the leader, ain't nothing with him. And he didn't know that. Well, I hope he didn't know. <laughs> did not know because he had a other plan in his back pocket and as time go by he start rolling out his plan I rolling out his plan I rolling out his plan and he thought he would have gotten away with the plan he actually calculated how he would have done it but they say if you study when you reap the what? Whirlwind. The whirlwind. And somebody said, man, nice quote today now. When I remember it, I'm going to talk about it. Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, we are wrapping up because, you know, we're going home <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> I'm going to let somebody finish this. When first you practice to deceive, nobody going to finish it for me? <laughs> All right, y'all gonna catch it. Huh? Madam Speaker, that is what this government was predicated on. And to the dismay of a lot of people who were involved, but later realized that they were just part of a larger plot and they were just pawns. And that is why, even though I say sometimes we hit the members on the other side, we have to do a, a larger reflection on the situation. Because I think once it was recognized, there were those who were bold enough to say, boy, this can't be. This can't be. And so I have like, I highlighted a number of instances of, this hap of what happened. And I'm asking the people of St. Kitts and Nevis never to go down that road again. And that is why we will do all that we have to do to make sure that this does not happen again. Madam Speaker, I want to say that since our administration took the reins of government, we were able to do a number of transformative things for our people in quick order. We were able, one, to lift the restrictions. Again, the restrictions were shrouded in corruption because my first meeting on the 17th of August, which was, I think, a Sunday, first meeting, I said, show me the scientific data to keep these restrictions. I thought they would have just said, well, Dr. Joe, I knew the data showed that we could relieve some of them. I was shocked when they said, Dr. Joe, we don't even need to test people coming into St. Kitts. I said, wow, I can deliver more than I promised. And that the member from number seven 
knew this since May and kept the restrictions for political reasons, hurting our economy. Our economy lost tens of millions of dollars because of those extra months of restrictions that should not have been there. You should pay it back. Of course. <clears throat> it is why here in shop because he does not want to be held responsible for the mismanagement of this country and the corruption that reigned under him and was overseen by him. And so we're able to lift the restrictions, Madam Speaker. And then to go further, Madam Speaker, we actually, after we lifted the restrictions, we opened up the country. Even the tourists were happy. I met I over in Marriott for something and People walking up to me who I never seen, and they say, thank you. I start to ask, so what are they saying thank you for? They say, well, you lift the restrictions. And so they were able to come into the country and enjoy our beautiful federation, Madam Speaker. We went further, and we decided that we would have paid, not the honorarium, but the gratuitous payment. Because again, you see, I don't blame a lot of people who act sometimes, because I know that the ethos of leadership can influence people. And so people were not being fed the correct scientific data at times. Because if I only found out that on the 7th of August, even the restrictions we had internally could have been eased, and people would have eased them had they known the scientific data. But he hid the scientific data from the people. And so people made decisions on the limited information that they had. And so they can't totally be held responsible in that sense. And so we're able to pay the people the gratuitous payment. And so I think that brings some restorative justice. Because during that time when people say, no, you can't lock us down and force us. The Honorable Senator spoke about a young woman who I went across the prison to see. She young, she went home, and she locked down because she had a piece of card protesting. She has a right to protest. She wasn't causing a disruption. How can you lock down somebody for 72 hours? And now that the data has come out, showed that she had a reason to stand where she stood. Is he going to pay for that? Those are the kind of things I'm talking about, Madam Speaker. Lock up, because I remember during that protest, when the tear gas were let go, there was a young lady who got a serious asthma attack. I had to rush to the hospital with the young lady. She was pregnant at the same time. She had already losing consciousness. I said to one of the police officers, you can't let her die. That is how serious it got. I'm happy that I was on this spot. At this, it come like I'm always on this spot, boy. <laughs> I took a flight the other day and I was on this spot. Yeah. But I'm happy that I was on this spot to assist the young woman to get to the hospital. Those are the kind of things that took place, Madam Speaker. And so we're able to bring some level of restorative justice with respect to that. And then, you know, we pay the honorarium. The member from number five said people making noise about the honorarium. The member from number five should not have spoken about honorarium. Let somebody else talk about it. He was in a government that gave a handful of people honorarium. Even a member from his own constituency or from his constituency who got $27,000. While well, the maid of the hospital who was doing all the cleaning of the excretions that were filled with virus could not get a dollar because she's a maid. And I dare say that that minister was not on the front line. And in my estimation, was not qualified for honorarium. You home in your cozy corner while well, the maid of the hospital cleaning the excretions, exposing herself to a possible deadly virus 
And then when I talk about giving risk pay on honorarium, you're saying it's country above self. But while you're condemning me for arguing for on the behalf of the frontline workers, you are collecting twenty-seven thousand dollars. How can that be right? <laughs> How can that be right? And that is why he should not have even spoken about the honorarium. Just keep him out shut on it. Over two thousand something persons were able to get honorarium as a result. And they deserve it. Over five million dollars. I know there was some discussion about the honorarium. But the honorarium were given to the frontline workers who are those in the um, in carrying out their work that they were necessarily exposed to the virus and possibly death. That has to be recognized separately from almost everything else. A nurse cannot totally separate herself from the patients. A police cannot a policeman or woman cannot totally separate him or herself from her patient, from, from the person who they're trying to probably apprehend. These are frontline workers. But we also recognize that there were essential workers within the public service that kept the, cost, the system going. And so that is why we decided to give a bonus. Because you have to justify these things. Why did you give the honorarium? Because they deserve it. If the virus had been more virulent, which means more deadly, then it means, therefore, that they would have died. And so people put themselves on the front line not knowing whether they would live or die. I mean, that has to be recognized. I want to recognize them and thank them for what they would have done for all of us. And because, you know, you had the public servants and they work hard, you, you say, even though we're in a deficit, we will be able to recover. But, you know, you, you have to recognize that as well. And then we went on further. We are doing a lot of things during this time to make sure that prices don't go so high. We are paying a lot of money monthly to keep Skelec afloat to make sure that that cost is not passed on to the people so they can keep the lights on. We may not give the rebate in an actual rebate, but each bill will show that you are being compensated to some extent. And the Minister of Energy will do that. That is what is happening. We are taking those steps, and we are taking those measures. We pay the dividend because we said there's a state asset, and we said those who are registered with Social Security and so forth will be able to. He talking about dividend. Can you imagine that? Leave that for somebody else. Never before in the Caribbean has that been done. The idea of sharing state asset with the people who own it is a new concept to the Caribbean. Never has been done before. And so we are looking for innovative ways in making sure that we can reach all of our people. Madam Speaker, as I come to my wrap-up wrap-up, after I would have gone through that, I want to say that we look forward to a 2023. We are saying that the 2023 is going to present its own challenges. But we will step up to these challenges with innovation, hard work, and commitment, Madam Speaker. We have heard from all of the ministers who would have spoken about their various ministries, and they would have put forward their comprehensive plans. I want to say to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis that this is just part of the process. We will consult with them as we go forward. So, Madam Speaker, in this year coming up, the budget is comprehensive, innovative, and it builds towards resiliency. With respect to the CBI program and its dependence, we see the CBI program as being important as well. It has done well for us. And we will see that we do some weaning, as a matter of fact. Because over the last seven years, no new industries came to sink it. None. As a matter of fact, we had four factories closed down. Nothing new to add to this economic development. Agriculture, we know, suffered to some extent. Because when the question was asked during the COVID, what happened to agriculture or what happened to food, the answer was the boats are coming. And we'll expand our agriculture and we will increase our agriculture output to deal 
partly with the imported cost of inflation. We have allotted more money to agriculture, more investments um, to come um, as well, uh, Madam Speaker. When it comes to tourism, we are looking at the MRGs, new flights, new airlines to come into the space. As you know, we are the buzziest country. The buzziest, and we become the busiest as well. That is what we intend to, to do. When it comes to the marijuana industry, we plan to build it out. It can be a source of income for our people. And we want those who we consider the traditional growers to benefit significantly from it as well. The CBI, as I've said, is important and we'll continue to make sure that we do what we have to do to make it strong so that all who are involved can benefit from our CBI um, program. We intend, Madam Speaker, to deal with the cost of energy through looking at alternative sources, our renewable sources, because we know once we do that, that can set us on a new path. At the same time, Madam Speaker, we have to resolve our water issues, which was pointed out. We have to also look at the education of our people when we roll out our, we have heard from the Minister of Education, health, economic development, investment, sustainable development, as we go around, even our social protection programs, on all of this, Madam Speaker, that was spoken of, none of this is possible unless you have the rule of law. And I want to really lead people to consider reading about, I think his name was Breyer, he was a Supreme Court judge. I think he retired this year, and I think his name is Breyer. Justice Breyer. Justice Breyer. Breyer. Yeah, Breyer? Breyer. Right. And his whole, I listened to him carefully and I've read him. And he, like no other, is a scholar on the concept of the rule of law. And he has put forward that without the rule of law, nothing else matters. And it is the truth. If you don't have law and order, nothing else matters. But we also recognize that to have law and order, you must have equal rights and justice. And so that is important. Very, very important. He has a home in Nevis. Oh, he, you see? He has a home in Nevis. So hopefully one day I can have a conversation with him because what he has really put forward to the world is that the rule of law is fundamental. And I want to thank the AG for really pushing forward and what he's pushing forward on to make sure that we are a state where the rule of law reigns supreme, but predicated, of course, on the principles of equal rights and justice. Madam Speaker, I want to say to the people of my constituency, constituency number eight, because I'm the prime minister, sometimes I speak generally and not get to focus on my constituency at times. But I want them to know, from St. Peter's, we have a number of critical projects, our road that we'll talk about, our roads, our, our water situation as well, as well as the development of our sporting complex um, that will also be done. We are looking at the improvement of our community center to launch one of the elderly care program at our community center. We are going to do some work on our um, health center. It needs to be bigger. St. Peter's is now the biggest area outside of Bastia um, in St. Kitts. And then all of the other programs, our people will definitely benefit from it. In Connery, we already have the funding to do the Connery um, sports complex, or the stands and the change rooms, we're gonna do that over in Connery. Um, in Connery also, we are going to build houses, and we're also looking at building our um, health center there, which will be a smaller version health center to suit, but it is necessary as Connery um, is expanding as well. And when it comes to the agricultural sector, we know that part that is just under the airport, we are already helping with the water situation. We'll develop the greenhouses there and get agriculture back on track. And then we'll go to Keys. We have some work to do at the community center that they call the school, some at the playing field, of course, that we have to get done um, for the people um, of Keys. And as we go to Kayon, I think the water situation is a real vexing issue, and that is why bead will be starting in Kayon, and we hope to deliver water to Kayon in quick order. In addition to that, we also have the solar plant that the UAE is doing with us in Canada, and that is supposed to produce about 300,000 um, 300, gallons, and that we think should be able to supply. So we have a backup um, for Kayon even, because the water situation has to be solved. In Kayon, we need some work done on the field as well. 
the community center needs some attention. The field in Upper Kayon um, also needs an attention. We need an alternative route to get around Kayon for when there are uh, accidents and so forth. We need some work on the school, the high school, the primary school not so bad, but the high school which you know the Minister of Education has already committed to. And so throughout the whole constituency, we have a whole development plan. In Half Moon, the water situation is part of it. And when we do that um, plan with Marriott, Half Moon should receive water as well. And the verges in Half Moon is really a problem. And I've already spoken to our czar, who is to maintain the cleanliness of St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, Geraldo Herbert, I've told him about Half Moon. He's going to get his team in there to make sure that we keep the verges and so forth clean in half moon. So that everybody in the constituency, that the major issues uh, be, would be looked after. I also would move to develop the Heroes Park and make it into a beautiful attraction, tourist attraction, where it can actually become a revenue generating park where people can come pay. We'll have opportunities for people to, to read, right? To read the history, to hear the history in, in sound, people can have activities there, can go there and have a meal, some snacks, read your history at the same time, have tours. And so we'll convert it into a place where tourists can come, school children can come, and any citizen can go where they want to learn more about their history. And in addition to that, we'll also make sure that we go to the, 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 the Robert Bratchers Park in St. Paul's and make sure that we do significant development there, especially for the 40th anniversary that is earmarked as well. And as well, we're going to develop our planners, and we have funding for it, and we are seeking to build out the Robert Bratcher um, Museum, which is in Fortlands as well. And so we are looking at that. Because we move forward economically, we want to make sure that we bring our civic life along with it. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to say that the people of constituency number eight must know that their representative is here to work hard for them and to continue and to push forward the development in Bayfords and so forth. So I can speak about number eight and what is coming for a very long time. But I think that I have done justice to defending this budget. And I want to wrap up again by, I know this is the second time, by thanking the members on this side for their excellent work. I want to thank the members on the opposite side for their debate as well, because I think, you know, and they what? <laughs> for participating in, in, the, in the debate as well. I want to thank you, Madam Speaker, the clerk, the officers um, who are here, the media people, the people in the gallery who come to listen uh, from time to time, those who are listening by radio, by internet. You know, I want to, hmm? all those who are involved in this operation, because this is fundamental, and of course, this is what helps to preserve our democracy that we enjoy, and so we cannot take it for granted. And I want to thank all of the civil servants and the public servants for the hard work um, over the years. I want to thank all of the citizens for all the tremendous work that they have put in. We have come through a difficult two years, and so we are calling this now COVID revenge. And I'm making sure that we have a carnival like we have never, uh, yeah, like we have never had before. And so, right. So, Madam Speaker, I know I've spoken a very long time. Maybe on the adjournment, I'll give the others um, an opportunity, really, to also um, um, expound. And with that, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you very much.